Well, hello and welcome to the forum. My name is David Morgan. I am a healthcare policy correspondent for Reuters in Washington, and it's my pleasure to be your moderator today for a panel discussion about the 2014 midterm elections, which took place on Tuesday, and what they mean for the Affordable Care Act. Now, this may come as a surprise to some people, but the Republicans won. And um, so the grand old party is preparing to take over management responsibilities of the U.S. Senate in January. That'll be for the first time in 2006. We will also be talking about the 2016 presidential campaign. And while 2016 may seem like a long way away, some people seem to feel that the campaign uh, got underway in earnest early on Wednesday morning. So it will have a direct uh, effect on health policy and what happens in the next Congress. Um, what all of this boils down to is that the Affordable Care Act, which is President Obama's signature domestic policy achievement, remains in politically turbulent waters more than four and a half years after he signed it into law. And fortunately, the forum has assembled a panel of outstanding experts to help us navigate those waters and arrive hopefully at a better understanding of what it all means and where it's all going. I'll introduce the panelists in a couple of minutes. First, I wanted to say welcome to the audience here in the studio and the audience online. These events that follow elections tend to attract viewers from across the country and in far-flung corners of the globe. Now, um, this presentation is a collaboration between the forum at the Harvard School of Public Health and Reuters, hence my presence here. Reuters is live blogging this as I speak. And the way it works is that each panelist will provide opening remarks and then we'll have a rather extended discussion about the recent elections and the upcoming presidential campaign before we throw it open to questions from the audience. Um, and if you are online and have questions you would like us to ask, the best way to get them to us is twofold. First, you can email them to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu, or you can tweet them, believe it or not, to at forum hsph with the hashtag um, 2014electionsaca. And with that, we'll get to introductions. To my right is Robert Blendon, Professor of Health Policy and Political Analysis at the Harvard School of Public Health. Bob is a leading expert on health policy, politics, and public opinion. To his right is David Cutler, Professor of Economics at Harvard University. David has played an important role in crafting healthcare policy here in Massachusetts and served as an advisor to the 2008 Obama campaign. To David's right is John McDonough, Professor of Public Health Practice at the Harvard School of Public Health and Director of the school's Center for Public Health Leadership. John was Senior Advisor on National Health Care Reform for the U.S. Senate Committee on Health Education, Labor, and Pensions back when the Affordable Care Act was being written and enacted. And coming to us via video link is Sheila Burke, who is adjunct lecturer in public policy at Harvard's Kennedy School, where she was also executive dean. Um, she has uh, served as deputy secretary of the Smithsonian, and like others on the panel, she's an actual survivor of the political wilderness. Sheila was chief of staff for Senate Majority Leader Bob Dole, and was deputy staff director for the Senate Finance Committee uh, at an earlier time when the Senate was also under Republican control. Now, before we begin our discussion, we want to give everybody a taste of the rhetoric that has been flying around the country for several months. We've got four actual campaign ads. Two of them are, if you listen to my language, pro-ACA, and two of them are anti-Obamacare. And so with that, let's roll the videos and then we'll begin the discussion. <laughs> as a doctor, I see how Obamacare hurts patients' access to care. As a mom, I know it hurts families. My son has diabetes and our insurance was canceled under Obamacare. Like many, we now pay more for less coverage. 
Mitch McConnell is working for common sense health care reforms. That starts with repealing Obamacare. And Mitch is leading the fight because he cares about patients and families like mine. I'm Mitch McConnell and I approve this message. Are you one of the 335,000 Coloradans? That's how many people's plans were canceled because of Obamacare. Can you really afford to pay thousands of dollars more? Your health plan canceled. All because Mark Udall said yes to Obamacare. Now Udall says he'd do it to us again. I would do it again, yes. I would do it again, yes. Call Mark Udall, tell him to speak for us, and stop supporting Obamacare. When Mark was diagnosed with cancer, we thought we might lose him. My family and my faith helped me through the rough times. But you know what? Mark's insurance company didn't want to pay for the treatment that ultimately saved his life. No one should be fighting an insurance company while you're fighting for your life. That's why I helped pass a law that prevents insurance companies from canceling your policy if you get sick or deny coverage for pre-existing conditions. I'm Mark Pryor and I approve this message. I was born and raised in Alaska. I'm a mother, a runner, and a breast cancer survivor. I was lucky. I beat cancer. But the insurance companies still denied me health insurance just because of a pre-existing condition. I now have health insurance again because of Mark Baggage. Because he fought the insurance companies so that we no longer have to. Put Alaska First is responsible for the content of this advertising. So that was some of the heavy artillery from the campaign trail. And uh, now the war is over. The Republicans have won. So, Professor, what happens now? Uh, hi, uh, Bob Lennon. Uh, I have a history of thinking elections matter. <laughs> and so in this case, uh, it's not a mandate for anything. What it's going to matter is the environment it creates. The environment's going to have two effects. It's going to encourage Republicans, they will not be able to repeal this bill, but to scale it back for the future very significantly. Uh, secondly, at least 20 states will not go ahead uh, with the Medicaid uh, expansion until they particularly see what the Congress does. But let me explain how this happens. Uh, so first, it has to do with the views of candidates. So this is what we now know. A Brookings study looked at the uh, ads uh, for all the primary runners who were Republican for the House. 73% of them said, if you vote for me, I will repeal this bill. None said I will improve it. Uh, now we know that there are 10 new Republican senators who are coming. We analyzed their stance. Every one of them said, I will repeal this bill if I'm elected. Uh, for this. So it's very hard to see how uh, they will move back. Then let's take a look at the voters and uh, if we could show this slide for just one second. Uh, first, uh, people lose the uh, recognition. Six in 10 adults in the United States never voted. So we are talking about four in 10 adults. And people uh, at Nightly News, Lincoln, they keep talking about voters. For a party that wins, voters are not important. It's the voters who voted for you that are important. So this looks at people who actually voted and uh, says what should happen uh, to the ACA. And briefly, if you'll look, the Republican bar says 56% want it repealed, 27% want it scaled back. The independent uh, bar doesn't want it repealed, 34%, but 27% want it scaled back. Uh, the Democrats were 74% uh, implement. W why are we having this discussion? Because the Republicans won the majority of Republican and independent voters. They got almost no Democrats. So the views of Democrats are not going to play on most, most of these committees. Uh, then I got emotional in the middle of this discussion, and I wanted to know if anybody cared about universal coverage. So we actually joined in this and did our own poll and said, okay, this is a central value. What do you think about this? And 12% of Republicans said it's a good idea. 39% of independent voters said it was a good idea. And of course, 70% of Democrats did. Well, who controls the committees? 
the 12%. Uh, for that. So uh, uh, that is the critical thing. And the third thing has to do with donors. And so a lot of us pick up newspapers and you'll see something about some sort of a cyber attack. I didn't realize it. How did it happen? Well, we actually had a cyber attack of donors. So while we're all debating this issue, somebody went out and bought $400 million of anti-ACA ads. Now, I'm more of a country boy here and that appears to be a lot of money from my point of view. While the newspapers in the summer were telling us this issue does not count, does not count, they told me, uh, basically somebody went out and bought 37,000 negative ads. And while everybody said it didn't matter, they have now published the data for Republican House and Senate candidates. The issue they spent the most on was healthcare, not the economy, not the deficit. It appears to move angry people by running those ads over and over again. So if you just put the three together, uh, basically what I promised, what I ran, uh, what the voters who voted for me cared about, and the fact I am gonna owe $400 million, somebody out there is gonna call me on the phone and say, we bought a lot of time for you. Don't tell me you're gonna do nothing. So my take is you're not gonna see this till May. Uh, but comes May, a lot of Republicans who just won are going to say, I can't go home by something symbolic. And you're going to see this newspaper symbolic vote, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, go home. Or, or cut some tax for a company that most people don't even know what it is. They cannot go back. I think you will see a ferocious fight through taxes and regulation of rolling back part of this bill because they can't go home without it. But history has not yet been written about what's going to happen. And, um, of course, uh, everything that comes out of Congress over the next two years will run straight into um, the potential for a presidential veto. So from a broader perspective, David, from a federal and actually state political perspective, how much do you think you'll s we'll see happen between now and the time uh, the presidential election takes over the conversation? Well, I think it's going to be a very interesting couple of years, although, uh, um, like Bob, I think it's going to be extremely contentious. At the federal level, I honestly don't see major things happening, and I don't know what's going to then happen as a result of that. But there are a number of, of issues on which the Republicans would like to scale it back, and they'll get some Democratic support, things like medical device tax and health insurance premium tax. None of those were in there for any obvious health reason. They were in there to raise money, so the thing would sort of pay for itself, but if no one wants to raise money that way, that's fine, they'll sort of go away. The more contentious issues would be the employer mandate and the individual mandate. The employer mandate, you're actually not gonna find an enormous democratic groundswell to keep it, so it may be that that disappears. I don't think that's a huge issue for most people. There's a clash coming over the individual mandate, and this is the one issue in the bill on which the president is probably on the wrong side relative to where the population is. So if I were the Republicans, that's where I would go. Every other issue, when you explain the specifics, people like the specifics of, of the ACA. The president indicated the other day he's not prepared to go back on that. So there may just be a very big clash in any case, I suspect that in order to get something done, the president, from the Republicans, the president will have to be seen as having lost, which means that, and he's not prepared to lose on this. So my guess is it turns into acrimony without an enormous amount of accomplishment. I think more consequential in terms of what actually happens was the impact of the election at the state level, where you had a lot of states where if they had gone Democratic, they would have probably expanded Medicaid coverage. They went or stayed Republican, in which case they won't expand Medicaid coverage. And the groundswell of Republican antagonism was so immense that some states may go back and they may say, well, we have expanded Medicaid coverage, but given how much our people don't like it, maybe we should think about going back on that. Or we just threw out the guy who, or gal who expanded Medicaid coverage. So maybe now that there's someone new and more conservative there, that they will want to take that away. I think that is a really, really serious issue to watch. Um, what it's going to run into is, to some extent, the mobilization of individuals, that is, people who have coverage uh, under Medicaid, and how mobilized will they be? And to some extent, how mobilized are the medical care providers? 
because if you take that away, what you're doing is you're taking a lot of money away from doctors and hospitals. They've been getting edgy about it. Many of them pushed very hard for the expansion of Medicaid, and now taking it away will put a lot of them on edge, and so you're going to see that tension playing out. And then finally, one other issue, if I were um, the administration, I wanted to, to um, put the Affordable Care Act in a better position. What I would do is not worry nearly so much about the politics because everything suggests you're brewing towards a big fight and you're just going to have that fight. But try and finally get your act together on how to run the thing. So there have been so many stumbles ranging from the people who lost their insurance policies to the website that didn't go down, that, that didn't work and went down. And actually continue it through the VA scandal and through Ebola. And what you get is a picture of administration implementation on health that's just abysmal and that feeds into a perception that this is too big and too unworkable because they can't get anything right. And so if they want to change the dynamic for those people who want to fix the ACA, what they have to prove is that they can actually get something done. And if they put their heads to the grindstone and figure out how to do that, then, then that's the way that they'll, that they'll change perception, more than just fighting last year's battle back and forth. Hmm. And of course, the great Republican strength is that they'll be coming into this majority with a, a, a cohesive force uh, united behind a single plan for addressing Obamacare. Is that right, Professor? Not so much. <laughs> <laughs> and that's one of the interesting elements that gets glossed over in these days immediately after the election. I think there are five interesting things to think about in terms of the new Republican majorities in the Senate and the House. Um, first one is, four and a half years later, uh, there is still no replacement plan. There is no partial replacement plan. There are no signs of it. Uh, Eric Cantor, who lost his primary in the spring, tried to assemble a replacement plan and couldn't even get it brought to the floor. Mm -hmm. So if they want to be a governing party, which is the signal that they're sending, they have to have their own proactive replacement agenda. And as of now, it's nowhere in sight. So that's the first thing. A second thing is there will be a sharp division within the Republican Party about go for total repeal or not. Uh, the, the hardcore Tea Party aligned Republicans will absolutely demand it, insist on it, and the Republican primary fight will push that very strongly and make that a resonant message. And there are a lot of members, particularly members who are up for election in 2016 mm -hmm. with a more liberal electorate who are going to be hesitant about a vote to basically take coverage away from tens of millions of Americans who are now getting coverage, including more than 10 million prior uninsured. So that's going to be something important to watch. Third thing is as they get down to some of the particulars, when they try to take it apart, they're going to find that some of their important stakeholder supporters are not on their side. So for example, on the individual mandate, the insurance industry really thinks it's essential and actually wishes it were a stronger mandate than it actually is in the law. And that's been an important group that has been aligned with the party. Um, they will also be very protective of the provisions in the law that most people don't have a clue what it means, but it's called the three R's, the reinsurance, the risk adjustment, and the risk quarters. And I don't have time to explain that, except it's important to the insurance industry, and they like it, and it helps to stabilize. And if you take those things away, then you've got a negative impact in terms of premiums and the stability of this new market, which is actually far more stable than almost anybody assumed it would be. So that's another piece. And then the, the last thing I would just really want to emphasize is some of these things that they definitely will want to repeal, like the employer mandate, it's not a freebie. So if you take out the employer mandate and get rid of it, you can do that and there's a negative impact on the federal deficit over 10 years of $150 billion. Mm -hmm. If you eliminate the medical device tax, there's a negative impact on the deficit of $30 billion. Most of the juicy things that they would really like to pull out come at a cost. And they have a tough time agreeing on 
ways to pay for these kinds of things because the, all their instincts are to lower spending and never to raise revenues. And so the replacement fight, the way to find the money mm -hmm. to replace some of those things, unless they repeal the wonky congressional process that Sheila knows so well called PAYGO, uh, they could repeal that and then do it as a freebie. But frankly, there are other things that they really need to address too. On, on April 1st, the Medicare payment schedule for physicians goes over a cliff because of a wonky thing that no one's ever heard of very much called the sustainable growth rate that goes mm -hmm. back to 1997. Mm -hmm. And the cost of a repeal of that and fixing that is, guess what, over 10 years, $150 billion. But that's coming up and that has to be addressed before April 1st. So there are a lot of pressures. There are a lot of contradictions that get glossed over in these few days after the election. They're going to have a significant impact in terms of where we actually will be able to look two years from now and say what really happened down in D.C. regarding the ACA. Hmm. Uh, Sheila, given all these complications, what can the Republicans actually accomplish once they're in control of both houses of Congress? And how do they do it? Well, um, it is a pleasure to be with my colleagues. I'm sorry I'm not with you uh, in body, but I'm certainly with all of you in spirit. You're, you're, uh, at, it, you're at a uh, secure location yeah. somewhere in the continental United <laughs> States, is that right? I am. Yeah. I'm tell, in a cone. Tell, tell Dick Cheney Absolutely. we said hello. <laughs> I will give him your very best. Yeah. Um, it, 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 I agree with, with much as, of what has been said, but uh, let me just raise some additional points. And then I'd like to key off of what John just finished with. Uh, each of my colleagues has raised a number of the challenges that we face. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, and I think Bob would agree, uh, there is, uh, if nothing else, the message coming out of this election is that there continues to be a fundamental difference of view as to the role of government. Uh, and this is true across the board. It's not true simply with respect to health care or simply with respect to the ACA. Uh, but the message um, is that, in fact, there is a question about the scale and role and what it is that, that uh, in fact, we're able to do. David Cutler did a terrific job of sort of rolling through uh, the issues that have caused really that into bright relief in the last year or so, certainly the VA, certainly the Ebola response, uh, certainly the rollout of the ACA. And so there are a number of instances where uh, the question has arisen. And what you hear in many of these town hall meetings and in many of these candidates is not only the comments about health care, although watching the ads reminded me the happy days of the Harry and Louise ads, for those of us old enough to remember them uh, during the Clinton administration. Uh, but, es but essentially, there is a real message there, and I don't think it's a message the committee ignored in the course of what it is that has to be done going forward. Uh, I think one of the other interesting side notes in terms of the results of the election is we have the largest number of women in the history of the Congress, which, uh, which is a terrific story. Uh, I think it is, in fact, too early to really tell what the results of the election will be. Um, you know, we have to get through, I think, the organizing period. Uh, over the uh, next uh, month or so in terms of the committees and the committee chairman and the leadership in both bodies. Uh, but walking through sort of some of the things that have been raised. One, I think that the uh, it is in the interest of the Republicans in the House and the Senate to essentially walk largely in lockstep. Uh, John raises the question as to whether or not there, in fact, will be deep divisions within the party. Uh, that's something the Republicans are quite good at. Uh, which is striking the differences rather than the common elements. But I think there is a desire, certainly stated by Senator McConnell, certainly stated by Mr. Boehner, that they in fact want to at the outset have a common message, a common theme and common steps. There is no question there are differences in the party, uh, certainly among the more conservative members, uh, many of whom have been elected in terms of the new members to the Senate, the new members to the House, and people that are in the House and the Senate, whether it's Rand Paul or whether it's Ted Cruz, there are clearly differences there within the caucus, but I think it is in their interest to send a common message at the beginning. John is absolutely right. There is no obvious replacement. Uh, that conversation has gone on for a long period of time. Uh, there is no one solution. 
Uh, but in fact, I'm not sure they need a single solution at this point. Uh, I think the strategy may well involve going at certain elements where, A, they may com find common agreement with Democrats. The medical device tax uh, is one of those issues where some Democrats seem to agree. Uh, certainly with respect to the definition of full time, the number of hours that are considered is one that has been raised. Uh, the employer mandate, which has been delayed, uh, is one that certainly some Democrats seem to have agreed. So my guess is they may well look for opportunities where early on they can signal a message that they can govern and they can lead and they can get consensus in doing so. Uh, there are some other areas uh, going beyond health where it's in the interest of both the president you know, we all wish we were sitting at lunch at the White House today with the leadership, uh, which is a, an unusual occurrence that this president calls the, the leadership of the Congress down to the White House. Uh, but essentially, they're going to be looking for ways to move forward some other things, you know, whether it's trade whether it's tax reform, uh, whether it's the, you know, sort of Ebola. There are examples, for example, with um, uh, Fred Upton and Diana DeGette on the House side that have come together to look at 21st century cures and to look at moving forward an agenda with respect to uh, invention and support of research and so forth. So it's not only going to be the areas where they disagree, but areas where they agree. You know, the areas where they will clearly disagree will be other elements of the ACA, but also things like the Keystone Pipeline, things like immigration, which could, you know, set things on fire early in the 114th Congress. Uh, but to John's next point in terms of um, taking it apart causes some risk, doing things like the repeal of the medical device tax, which costs, or repeal of uh, the individual mandate, which costs, which could be an issue. Uh, but there are other opportunities. The subsidies, for example, where they could recover money by reducing the subsidies or the extent to which they are provided up the income scale. Uh, there are changes with respect to Medicaid. There are Medicaid matching rates. Uh, so there are opportunities where they could look at pieces of the legislation, not simply the full reform, although I think you will see votes to repeal. And they've made that commitment, and I think Senator McConnell, while acknowledging it's unlikely to be successful, certainly the president would veto. They don't have sufficient votes to override a veto, but certainly they will vote on that. But then they will start going after pieces. And again, as suggested, some of those pieces really undermine the basic structure of the bill. Many of the insurance reforms uh, could well essentially attack that. Certainly the individual mandate, which the insurers feel very strongly about. But I have to continue to remind myself that some of those elements were once supported by Republicans for years. The insurance reforms, whether it's the pre-X or rescission, all those things were in fact supported by the Republicans in years past. The subsidy to individuals to purchase private coverage was supported by Republicans and proposed by my old boss, Senator Dole, Senator Domenici, Senator Danforth, some years ago. The idea of buying into an individual private market rather than it creating a new sort of public entitlement program. So again, I think there will be tensions within the party. Uh, but again, I think the first thing they have to do is prove they can govern, prove they can lead. They will hopefully look for opportunities where they can partner with, with Democrats. But they're also really pushed to try and identify those issues that have been issues in the past and where they essentially were successful in the election. Well, thank you very much. At, at this point, we'd like to pause for a moment from our discussion about politics and Congress and the Oval Office to hear from, an, to, to hear from an actual <laughs> human being. <laughs> um, what you're about to see comes from a group called Families USA, which is a healthcare consumer advocacy group based in Washington, and they are an active supporter of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, my name is Sheila Rogers, and I live here in Richmond, Virginia. Also, I'm going to be 61 uh, this year in December. I was totally uninsured for at least six years before signing up on the marketplace through the Affordable Care Act. Uh, initially, I tried to sign up at home for health insurance through the marketplace. I found the navigator through a television promo, I think it was a PSA, public service announcement, and I heard about the Navigators. So I went online and looked up one here in Richmond and found a wonderful person, and she made it easy for me. 
I have the senior silver plan for health insurance. I have a very small monthly premium and it's also subsidized. So we get a tax credit for this. So it is a wonderful plan for me. One of the best things about having this health insurance is that I can afford more medicine now that helps me cope with this degenerative uh, problem in my neck, which I've had for over 20 years. And uh, I've been able to get additional medication now, all because of health insurance. I wouldn't have been able to afford it before. I would tell anyone to please get health insurance. It's much easier to prevent something and to maintain your health than to get into trouble and really need it. So is it really in the Republican interest to take away benefits from someone like her if they intend to capture the White House in 2016 or is Obamacare, quote unquote, um, better kept alive as a campaign issue? Uh, so w we miss the fact that there are 30 some million people who are still not covered. Uh, I don't think, uh, and please, I am not speaking for the Republican Party, it just happens they won. And so, uh, for that, so it's not their interest to go get the cards back. It is in their interest to not necessarily have another 20 million people uh, covered. And the law of politics is if I didn't get it, I don't miss it. And so I don't think they're going to go be running around Medicaid, taking it out of states, but I think they're going to allow states not to expand. I think they're going to reduce the subsidies and some people, instead of paying $20 a month, they're going to pay 50. Uh, so it's not in their interest, but as Sheila said, this division over government is really incredibly powerful in this country. And it, it really is affecting the future of this country. The ACA is caught in the middle about whether or not we want the federal government uh, to do. And uh, back to my uh, colleagues here, just, just one quick point. Uh, everybody studies under another president. The people who just won studied under President Reagan, whose view was cut the taxes and watch what happens afterwards. And lots of programs got cut under the Reagan years because the CBO kept saying it's going up, it's going up, low the deficit, it's going up, it's going up. And I think that's where it is. But deep in the heart of the people who are just surveyed, they don't want the bill of this scale to go, go into effect. And so when we get to 2016, there is going to have to be a big health care issue, and we're going to discuss that in a moment. But for people who are just elected, who ran in a primary and said over and over again, it's not going to be a national run plan, they can't go home. I wish they could, they can't. And tell them that all they did was uh, change a medical device tax. I know if you're in the industry, that's awfully exciting to you. Uh, but it's not what people were at the Iowa caucus about. So they have to make a change for them to be able to go back home and say, uh, I honored the pledge that I ran on and I won dramatically more than all the projections said. And that is what difficult is for people to understand is they won by margins, one after another larger, by telling you they're going to repeal this bill. Uh, so uh, they are going to feel a win for something to happen. Please, I'm not endorsing uh, that party, but it's very hard to look at the answers to voters and then say, no, they're really, they didn't mean it. They did mean it. So did the Democrats lose this time because of the Affordable Care Act? Uh, no. The, um, uh, uh, where it's very uh, difficult, let me make it simple to you. Basically, by the time in these swing states it came, to vote, president's approval rating was 35%. They just, the whole people just don't feel the president's taking this country in the right direction. And you know, that's why the name Obamacare is so important. The ad goes, wrong direction country, Obamacare. Economy not doing well, Obamacare. And so they just felt this was one way of saying to this president, you're taking the country in the wrong way. It was only one issue. But what everybody missed is, if I really dislike the government, really hate it, seeing an Obamacare ad is like a red flag. They came out and they voted. That's the group that is most affected by, by the impact, is conservatives who are angry at the government uh, feel that this law went too far. That is where they got uh, mileage out of this. Mm -hmm. John? You know, I, 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 I would argue with, with um, I think Bob's exactly right. I would add one uh, further element. I think it's always the case. Politics is remarkably local. Uh, and so while Obamacare or the ACA was an element 
Um, there were a host of other elements. You know, certainly the reference to the president's popularity uh, or lack of popularity is certainly a broader issue than simply the ACA. I mean, if you were to talk to Mary Landrieu, who's about to face uh, a situation where she's got to go back to the polls in December, my guess is there are a host of issues, not the least of which is the Keystone Pipeline. Uh, you know, there are issues that people were frustrated because immigration wasn't resolved. So I think it is clearly an enormously important issue. It rallied a lot of people. One of the issues was going to be turnout. Democrats historically are much better than Republicans at getting turnout. But what we saw in this election, which I think Bob would, would uh, confirm, is you saw a remarkable turnout. The red flag that the ACA resulted in certainly helped with that. Uh, but again, I think it, they were issues that were much broader. Uh, you know, why Ed Gillespie did as well as he did, although at the moment he seems to have lost in Virginia, I think surprised us all. Uh, and was it the ACA? Not clear, um, but it's a contributing factor. There's no question. Hmm. One of the more memorable moments from the campaign were the debates in Kentucky, hmm. where Senator Mitch McConnell, yes. who will be the majority leader, was asked whether he was okay with the hundreds of thousands in Kentucky who got coverage losing it and watching him do kind of somersaults and different kinds of yoga movements to, um, to try and explain it away. And he got away with it. And I think that really points to the stunning inability of the supporters of the law to come up with a compelling rationale that really resonates and sticks with the public to talk about the good news because Kentucky has been extraordinary in terms of its drop in on insurance, Kentucky yes. and Arkansas. And yet so many of those people we heard who actually got insurance still voted for someone who wanted to repeal the whole law. Hmm. I want to um, speculate about something. So, so we're talking about scaling back the law because it's perceived as too big. So on the one hand, you're going to have the new Republican majority say we ought to scale back the subsidies and we ought to scale back the Medicaid and so on. And then on the other hand, they're going, they're going to um, propose big tax cuts. So they're going to say we can't afford these subsidies, but we can afford these very big tax cuts. And everything we know is that every time the Paul Ryan budget comes up, which is cut taxes and cut spending massively, that it doesn't do well. That people, people will say, well, gee, if I don't cut taxes at the high end that much, I can keep the Medicaid spending. My grandmother, my mother can stay on Medicaid. We can get kids early education, whatever it is. So uh, unless you do this in a vacuum, it, I'm not sure how, it, I'm not sure how, how I, I, see, I can see it doing it in a vacuum, government's too big, let's scale back government. Mm. On the other hand, if it's government's too big, let's scale back government so that we can give a tax break to really rich people, that doesn't strike me, we, we, we kind of know that that one doesn't go over well either. So it's, it's not clear to me this isn't going to get caught up in some very, very big mm. budget fight. And once you turn from healthcare policy to budget policy, it's just become a very different issue. And it's not at all clear to me that the new majority will win that debate. Mm -hmm. So how does well, all this- David, um, you have to agree that um, in that area, and I agree with you that the reconciliation process, which is the budget process likely to be called into play if they can agree on a budget resolution, the press for on the tax side is not only held by the Republicans. So you will hear Democrats as well pressing, and you already are hearing Democrats press for looking at what we call the extenders, all the tax provisions that are expiring, the R&D mm -hmm. tax credit and a mm -hmm. host of others. Mm -hmm. When we get to corporate tax reform and individual tax reform, you will also hear Democrats arguing for simplicity. So I, I agree with you, if it were a stark choice, we're gonna you know, lower the taxes for Bill Gates and as a result, we're going to essentially cut the subsidies at $94,000 a year. But it won't be that clear. I mean, it'll be a much more confused, nuanced story so that the choices will be, and you're absolutely right, going into 16, I think Republicans have to be very cautious of this kind of comparison. But rarely is that comparison as clear as, as you described it. Yeah, there's a difference between kind of real tax reform and fake, fake tax reform. 
So real right. tax reform is we've got a tax code that's just god awful. Let's see if we can right. make it work better, collect the same amount of revenue, make it fairer, more more efficient, and so on. Right, and redistribute. And then right. exactly, and then there's sort of tax reform, which is basically we're taxing high income people too much and we ought to tax them less. Right. And that latter one right. is really the category where you get yourself in trouble. Actually, there's no economist who's not in favor of making the tax code work better. And there's no economist who doesn't have a list of right. 25 things that, right. they, that, they exactly. could, that they could think of to be on that list. Right, right. And there's no farming family that doesn't have a point of view about generation skipping taxes. Yes. I can assure you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, now that you've heard from us, why don't we hear from you and take some questions. Uh, I'd like to begin with the audience online because they are oftentimes the most neglected. Uh, Lisa, do we have Thank any questions? You, David, yes. And actually, our Reuters colleagues are emailing with a question of something that just landed here. So I'm, I'm going to start with that. Um, about a U.S. Supreme Court agreeing to hear the Obama subsidies case. The U.S. Supreme Court on Friday agreed to hear a legal challenge to a key part of the Obamacare health call law that, if successful, would limit the availability of federal health insurance subsidies for millions of people. In a one-sentence order, the court said it would decide a case brought by conservative challengers to the law. The plaintiffs appealed a July ruling by the Fourth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals that upheld the subsidies. The nine justices will issue a ruling by the end of June. So um, our Reuters colleagues are wondering of your opinion of this. Who would like to talk about that one? So it is an important matter that it's surprising that they were failing to wait to hear from the court in the District of Columbia, mm -hmm. which is also scheduled a hearing and that they are jumping the queue before they hear it. It's not unprecedented, but they had a very easy way out. So it suggests at least that the four justices who voted in June 2012 to repeal the entire law are at least there. I think the question is, were there more than four? And I think that would be one of the critical indicators in terms of going forward. Um, if, if, the, if, the, um, if, the if the lawsuit were upheld, um, then uh, it would either require Congress to come in and change the law, which is highly unlikely. At the same time, um, there are things that states could do to designate the federal exchange as the state exchange, either by executive order or state legislation that could do it. And it will be a very telling moment for both Congress and for state governments. Do they really want to see tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, in some cases millions of citizens lose their subsidies that enable them to keep health insurance? And it would certainly make it much more of a compelling issue for 2016. David, you might take two minutes to explain to the audience who don't follow these issues very closely uh, the nature of the debate, which is whether or not people essentially in exchanges that are run by the federal government, there are 36, I believe, uh, who are run by the federal government as compared to those who have chosen to run them by the state. Kentucky is an example where they, for example, have a state exchange. And the issue is over the language in the statute that essentially references subsidies through state exchanges. Uh, and I think the Congress, the, uh, certainly the Democrats, would argue that their intention was always that subsidies would be available to anyone in any exchange. But it, there is this language issue, and as John knows as well as I do, it's those little differences in how we draft that can sometimes make an extraordinary difference. But that's the, ba that's the debate, is the language in the legislation that says state-based versus federally controlled and run uh, exchanges, and who gets the subsidies. Sure. Just to give you, a, a, to follow up Sheila uh, and John, to give you one sentence on the economics of this. If you said that there were no subsidies that would be payable in the federally run exchanges, then essentially everyone who is healthier than average, which given that expensive people cost a lot, is probably about 70 or 80% of those exchanges, those people would drop out immediately. The premiums would skyrocket and the thing would just die. So literally, there would be no exchange coverage in 
those federally run states if the Supreme Court decides that the subsidies are not allowed to be paid and it's not picked up in some other way. So this is very, very consequential in those areas. Yes. Thank you. Can we have another question, please? Yes, we do. Um, I'll take this one. We've had some questions about women voters. How have reproductive rights issues such as access to abortion and contraception played out in this election? Some Republicans, like Cory Gardner, pulled back on their positions, it seems, around personhood amendments and that extreme sort of position. But by failing to support health reform, candidates like these deny reproductive rights anyway. How did the women's vote around topics like these play out? Uh, a smaller impact than was uh, predicted. Uh, th that is what the Republicans worked very hard. Uh, the personal amendment is that basically uh, life begins at I inception and therefore uh, the way the law of uh, abortion should be interpreted. They tried very hard to not have their candidates take strong stands and what you would see is that I ran for governor and said this or that and, and they were not uh, uh, it. Uh, it, it, it turned out uh, there always are a, a, sh a share of people who are voting on re reproductive rights, but when you look at the results, it did not play the way Democrats, this focus on getting out young women dramatically concerned about this issue uh, did, did not show out. And the gap between men and women in many of these states, which is what you usually find is, uh, we, we sometimes we have 15 percent differences between votes by, by gender were much smaller in many of these states. So the issue uh, did not play the way it was. And I think if there was a Republican retreat, they would be so proud that they restrained members from getting back in what used to be called the Aiken debate uh, about this. And the fact that it didn't turn out to be visible in these ads uh, basically made it less salient for voters. Hmm. Sheila, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think Bob's exactly right. I, I think people were quite surprised uh, that it had as little impact. Colorado is probably the yeah, best example right. uh, where Cory Gardner uh, stepped back from his earlier position, said it had been a mistake, uh, and then went forward very aggressively about allowing the purchase of contraceptives over the counter. Um, and so it sort of shifted the debate a bit, and then you began debating, you know, what are the impact of being able to buy over the counter and, you know, the pros and cons. And so I think the pivot away from his historical position to this new position certainly helped him in Colorado. Uh, I think Senator Udall worked aggressively to try and raise that issue and make it an issue and was unable to do so. And I think as Bob suggested, I think the, the party clearly suggested that they not make that a bedrock position for purposes of election campaigning around the issues about reproductive rights. And, and to a large extent, they didn't. And it really wasn't an issue. Well, let's see. Are there any questions here in the studio from our audience? Uh, we have one in the back, Lisa. Can you? Thank you. Uh, the ACA has been, uh, well, the, rather the government has been accused of, uh, of being uh, incapable, uh, as demonstrated by the poor rollout of the ACA. Uh, However, the background to the bill was a House bill which <coughs> allotted five billion for rollout, a Senate bill which allotted ten billion for rollout, mm. a reconciliation that reduced this to a billion, mm. half of which which was taken away in the various negotiations over the uh, stoppage of the government by the Republicans. So given that by fiat, this was woefully underfunded. How can one honestly say that this is a demonstration of incapable government, incapable legislation, maybe, but certainly not incapable government? Mm -hmm. Comments? Well, I, th I think it's a good example of it's not where you start, it's where you finish. Mm -hmm. So the rollout in the fall 12 months ago was a calamity, a catastrophe, a disaster, pick your apocalyptic term. And they were able to correct it by mid-December so that it was able to move forward. Uh, the CBO estimate was 7 million would sign up through the exchanges. It ended up around 8 million more in Medicaid 
Uh, the uh, estimate now is more than 10 million formerly uninsured got coverage through this period. The New York Times says the uninsured rate has gone down by 25 percent. So mm -hmm. I guess while I certainly wish the rollout had been better, I'd much rather be a winner at the end rather than have a great launch at the start and have mediocre results. The results exceeded expectations and unfortunately again it, it gets to the inability of the supporters of the ACA to create that compelling narrative. The, the, I, the iconic moment for me in the past year was when Jimmy Kimmel's show went out on the street and asked 10 random voters, do you prefer the Affordable Care Act or do you prefer Obamacare? And nine out of 10 said, I like the Affordable Care Act and I hate Obamacare. It was only the African-American guy who liked Obamacare and not the Affordable Care Act. And, but I think that exemplifies the incredible mystification of the American public about this law. Mm -hmm. sure. uh, uh, I, would add, I, I would add one additional point. I think John's right. I mean, a number of the problems were, were corrected and, in fact, people were able to enroll. But I think the final story hasn't yet been told. Uh, one, I think it'll be interesting to see what the impact is in the spring in terms of the IRS mm -hmm. and people receiving notices that either they got subsidies that they shouldn't have gotten or... Uh, you know, sort of pulling them back. I think there have been issues around um, your citizenship status and people getting notices because they weren't able to determine citizenship. Um, so I think, again, I think John's right. There has been progress and they did a much better job in the latter part of the year. Uh, but I think it wasn't just the process of rollout and informing people, it was all the technology and the failure of the systems that essentially brought uh, people a lot of concern, the interface with the states uh, was an issue. But I think, again, I don't think the story is fully known. And I think that will begin to roll out as we see the enrollment process begin this fall, which people say will be far smoother. But again, we're going to wait and see what happens in the spring when people start getting those notices that say you shouldn't have gotten a subsidy and now you're getting a tax bill or you didn't buy coverage and now you're getting taxed. Uh, two quickie. Uh, one is uh, when you're in government and they cut your budget in half, you're a good sport and say you can do it without it. And so, had the administration said we can't do it, then the answer would be, I guess we can't run the plan. So they never really made noise. Secondly, this is exactly what's about to happen uh, uh, for this. Anybody who's an engineer knows that if you pull a few things out from under the bridge, it'll start leaning. And so, they're going to go back and cut the administrative costs again. And the administration is going to say, we can do it, we can do it. Uh, uh, for that, and if it ta uh, goes back and forth, the news item will be the somebody who couldn't deal with the IRS. It won't be that the IRS has a student volunteer answering the telephone. Uh, that isn't what, it, what it'll be seen. But that is the tension of not having a broader support level for implementing this, that you battle at the level of taking the administrative funds away uh, when experts would say to you, you need a broader platform to make this work. Mm -hmm. I think we can squeeze in one last question from the audience. Uh, this young woman over here. I, I wanted to return to the question of universal health care coverage. I'm struck that uh, governments across the world struggle with how to cover the health care costs of their, their people, both for public and private systems. And the little facts that people across the world know about the United States is we spend you know, more per a higher proportion of their, our GDP on health care compared to any other country in the world, and yet we don't have universal health care coverage. How can this um, Congress in the next couple of years continue to justify the lack of full provision for uh, people in a country as wealthy as ours? You know, I've been doing some talking around the world, around the globe, because there's other countries that are just fascinated with the ACA and Obamacare and <laughs> what does this mean for us? And I tell them two things. The first thing I say is, listen, after Obamacare is fully rolled out by 2016, 2017, uh, and we have made significant progress and improvements, we will still have the most inefficient, wasteful, <laughs> disgraceful health insurance coverage system and you folks have nothing to learn from us. Just kind of, it's kind of like a sporting interest. It's World Cup health politics and watch us beat each other senseless over it. On the, on the delivery system side, on reforming the delivery of medical care services and making it more efficient, 
and effective and higher quality, we're doing some really exciting things and we've seen dramatic changes as David has documented very well in the rate of growth of medical care spending in the United States mm -hmm. over the past five years. And we don't have the answers, but we have a good, interesting story and conversation to have with societies mm -hmm. all over the globe. And that's what people around the world ought to pay mm -hmm. attention to while we tear each other's hair out over coverage. Bob. Uh, can I sort of just give you the depressing thought in my mind. Uh, in seven years ago, when asked, 67% of Americans said they thought this government should cover everyone. By the time we voted, it was down to 41. Uh, there is a messaging problem of how we talk to Americans about this issue. And for those of us who are convinced we know how to communicate, we had an incredible failure here. It's one thing not having a consensus, it's another actually losing the consensus over seven years. Something happened here and the people who were elected were not elected uh, to in fact make that happen in the next two years. And it's very clear, their voters were asked how big a priority of this, not big. Uh, so uh, you have to only change the outcome, but there's something that happening uh, in, in the culture here where we walked away from something where there actually was close to a bipartisan consensus. Well, I think that's a very interesting point to end on. I want to uh, thank the uh, panelists for, their, for sharing their keen insights into all of this. And thanks also to the audience for your participation and for helping this to be more of a discussion than simply a series of speeches. The discussion actually continues, though, on um, uh, forumhsph.org and on Reuters.com. And um, please join the forum for another live webcast on December 1st, which is World AIDS Day. Uh, the title of that program will be Treatment as Prevention. Can we treat our way out of the AIDS epidemic? Once again, that's December 1st at 1230 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Until then, thank you. <laughs>